Okay. Um, 1994-95, uh, Thunder Tiger produced a boat called Victoria. It took off. It was a it was a kit that was very popular. It comes with the deck, as you know, all all included. The hull. It's easy to build. There are a few things that have changed in it over the years. Uh, the older hulls were a little heavier. The older hulls float. You can tell if you've got an older hull, they'll float a little higher in the bow than they will in the stern. It's just tooling problems, so just tooling differences that they've had in them over the years. The newer kits, you have to be very careful that your rudder lines up because these two holes, the one that's in the deck, does not line up with the one in the bottom. And if you go and put it, you'll find your rudder will be like this. So you'll end up re-drilling the hole in the top of the deck and end up putting a washer over it and then seeing it and then making then making sure your rudder is straight. These things are critical if if you haven't got rudder and and uh, fin alignment in. The boat just it just doesn't want to sail. So given that when they the kit and you all know when you get your kit you've got your aluminum mast, you've got a set of sails which the newer ones now are much better than the old ones were. The old ones were like cardboard um, basically, the, we see now in the United States, there are some fleets that are doing a gold and a silver fleet because people, if they want to build one that's right out of the box and it's all stock, they want to race, but they didn't want to get into all of the fancy stuff that we do with these. So they'll build it box stock and they'll race in the silver fleet. The gold fleet is us primarily that we mess around with with these things. Through the years, Everything has been tried with these crazy boats. Believe me, you're not going to. There's no use reinventing the wheel. There isn't anything, including trying to redesign it by dropping the keel a half an inch longer. Looks like it's stock, but it ain't. Things really good, except when the wind gets high and she goes downwind, she falls on her nose. She'll trip on herself. She'll go right over with it. So that was thrown out. We were trying. To, they were going to try and do that and then see if we could change the rules. A lot of things have been have been done. Now they're very critical with when you go to the nationals or whatever about measurements. Uh, they will measure the distance. They have a jig that fits in underneath here that goes around your keel bulb and, and it goes around here and it comes up in here and it better touch the back of this so that you haven't you're not playing games with tilting and this kind of stuff. Um, they also do measurements on the sails. There are some key things on the mast. Uh, uh, points that are uh, written in the in the rules which you have to maintain. So, okay, you want to build a Victoria and you want to build it to race. Can anybody tell me what this boat's supposed to weigh full out, ready to go to race? Four and a half pounds. Now, what is four and a half pounds? Four pounds what? The United States, they'll argue with you. They'll say, no, 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 no. Mine weighed in at four six. That's it. It's four and a half pounds. No, 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 no. <laughs> we, I run into this more times than enough. It's four point eight. So you want to try and that's your target is four point eight to try and keep. The idea with the boat is keep as much weight down below as you can. Nothing up here. Absolutely nothing at all. You get your hull. First thing you're going to do is sand it. You're going to take all the mold marks out of it. You're going to sand it all down. Make sure you got all the mold release off of it. Uh, you're going to sand the deck as well. A few years back, we decided that we were going to try and get real smart and take the lines off the deck. And we thought they were going to change the rules. They didn't. Um, you have to have the lines on the deck. Try and keep everything as simple as you can inside. Now, I, I favor what the Bakersfield group does. If you go on Bakersfield Model Yacht Club, the guy there uses a triangle and mounts his sail servo on a triangle. Um, I use cedar because cedar is really light. Uh, I fit the uh, fit the sail servo to it and then epoxy the whole thing to the bottom of the boat. Where should it be located in the boat? You take a look in everybody's Victoria and you're going to see it all different. You're going to see some sail servos back here, some up here, some all over the place. The big thing is the balance point on the boat. See, she should balance. She should balance and not be, she shouldn't be you don't want to balance them like this or you got a problem with it. So I try and I run my sail servos from the center of the arm to the front of the bow X number of inches. And no, I'm not telling you what it is. <coughs> anyway, it, uh, it, it's something that you experiment with. 
One of my boats I experimented by putting the sail servo on the right hand side and I put the batteries on the left. And that's the heavy weather boat that I've been lucky enough, the blue and orange one that, I win, that I've won so much stuff with. She, she only goes out if it's 20 and above. Other than that, she stays at home. She went out once this year and won Sailmaker's Cup with her because she was blowing heavy. This I pretty much keep in the center. Uh, I, like, I like using a mini servo in the back, mounted in the back. Again, on uh, Bakersfield, they'll show you. Mini servo gives me, uh, I think it's about 60 or 70 ounces of torque. Never had one let go. Charlie's gotten a couple wet, and I think he blew one. Um, I CA the case all around the bottom where the, where the joint is and the screws in case there's water. I mount it up in the, on the back and then balance it accordingly. Okay, but balance the boat accordingly. So I don't have a sail servo in here. It's, it's all back in here. Straight rod, try and keep it as straight. My receiver is mounted behind the deck here on Velcro, behind the rear deck as well, and an on and off switch. This just makes life a lot easier as far as not having to untape your hatch. So, uh, the only other thing that I do differently with it is we've done a lot of heavy water sail or heavy weather sailing with this boat, and we found she likes to nosedive. And if you put the have the hole in the deck, and you don't have it raised at all, uh, you'll get water inside the boat. A couple, few years back, Charlie and I decided what we were going to do is run everything above the deck. So that's why I run a double purchase block back here. Everything comes out the back hole here, which the chances are you're going to get water through there through the blocks, up through the deck, up through here. So there are no holes in the deck at all. Once that, ha that hatch is all taped down and everything, there's no way of water getting in unless the thing sinks and it comes through, you know, through one of the holes here in the back. So it's completely done. Don't try and reinvent the thing. It, on the deck, you've got three dimples, okay, for your side stays. Use the back two. Only use the back two. Take your, take your screw eyes, drill a smaller hole in the screw eye, CA the thing, put a washer on it, screw the thing in. I've never pulled one out yet. Never had one pull out of the deck. People ask me about the front, the mass step. What do I got to do with a mass step? You know, they sell in, uh, out of Vancouver, they sell a kit with adjustable stuff for your mass and all that stuff. You won't use it. You won't use it. We've done all that before. The, the original one that comes in the kit in the stock location works like a charm. It's so... Like I say, don't reinvent it. Use it. The keel nut. We take the keel nut and we cut the keel nut off. It's too long, and you'll save weight by cutting it off. You'll be able to cut off, I forget what it is. I think it's an eighth of an inch or something like that with it. Um, up here, you've got <coughs> you've got a, see where that dimple is that's up here? That's where everybody puts their, their uh, forestay, right? See where the forestay is on this boat? And there is no lead weight. I have never run a lead weight on this boat. Don't have to. The rule of thumb is, and I don't know why, I'm not that great with mathematics. The rule of thumb was if, if this was 12 inches long, a third of that should be where your attachment point is, right? That's the way the thing is figured out. Well, a few years back, I got messing around with something and I moved it and I put it where it is now and she'll flip out like crazy. I don't need a lead weight. I don't need it. So now I've saved some weight. I don't have any lead on it at all. Um, we used to, the first the rig I did, I used a 3 8 mast, which is basically what they call for. I now use a quarter inch mast and 1 8 booms. And everybody said to me, you'll never ever run 1 8 booms and not, and not break them. I have never, knock on wood, never broken a boom yet. And I've sailed this rig on another boat in uh, 30 mile an hour winds and never broke them. So it's, uh, it keeps weight out. A few years back, uh, Charlie and I went to Dallas, Texas to race the Nationals. Now this place was, this was a, a lake, it wasn't a pond, it was a lake, and it was seven miles long and the wind blew right down that lake. We drove 20 some hours, we got there, 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, looked at the water, I said to Charlie, this is all right, this isn't that bad, nice gentle breeze, and he says, we'll go check in the motel, we'll come back at 11. We came back at 11 and it was blowing about 25 then. The day we raced, it was blowing 30 with gusts of 35. The only way you could, and it had a chop of about two feet. The only way you could tack was on top of a wave. I said, you got to be nuts. We're taking these things out in that. So I show up with this rig. And I was really proud of this because I'd done a, just a ton of work on this thing. It had, 
I made a oh, let's get another one. I made a mold and I made curved booms out of balsa in the center and aircraft ply and I had ball bearing here and here and a 3 8 mast and look at that crane isn't that pretty <laughs> it was all carved up and and I had a big screw eye here and I ran these sails in it and a guy named Budman came and I had a lead weight and I was ready for do battle and then a guy from Budman came up from Mr. Budman from Houston said to me man I really like your boat I love the crane but he says you know what he said I gotta tell you it's all wrong and I said why and he said well I want you to do something for me and I said okay what he said I want you to take the I want you to take the fin off your boat I said okay fine and this is a simple exercise and it'll tell you how far you're going as far as your rig weight the other thing I do is all my lead keels I weigh them all and they're all marked that's a 1038 I've had them as high as 1050 different conditions the old argument about the new new ones now this is a lead bulb the new boats now all have that uh, it's sort of a metal lead it's got it has got lead in it anyway it's metal whatever and it looks like it's pregnant so when they first came out everybody went oh my god that's crazy that'll we'll lose boat speed we'll lose this there is no difference in it there's some of the top sailors in the United States have tried to test side by side by side they look bigger there they come in at the same weight it's just something that Japan now won't ship lead out unless it's even if it's coated like this was in the kit Germany, on the other hand, with a micromagical, sends you a piece of lead for a keel, and it hasn't got any paint or anything on it. So uh, it's just different countries have diff different stuff. Anyway, what he told me to do was to take this off, and to take your boat, and to grab it, to grab it like this in the middle of the cockpit, like that, and see where what what your mast does. Actually, a little ahead, like that, at the balance point. So, see the mast. Okay, that rig on this boat, that sucker went like this. And he said, that's your problem. He says, you've got way too much weight up here. You don't want anything up in here at all. He says, you want it to do that. This is exactly what you want. So I said, well, that's great. What do we got to do? He said, well, you got to get rid of some of the stuff that you got in there, i.e. the screw eyes, the beautiful, the beautiful top on the mast. All of that stuff's got to go. So I came home and I built my first one of these. And I don't put anything in here. I drill the mast right through, run run the side straight wire right through it, and I wrap it and see it. Wrap it with uh, uh, string, same rigging string, and just see it and paint it flat black. Um, what I do if I have to up here, that's the smallest brass cotter pin you can buy. And I drill a hole, put the at the at the control point. Now what is it? Thirty seven and whatever. Fold the thing out here. CA the back of it and then make sure it's smooth so nothing will catch up on it, okay? Uh, I use the smallest swivel that I can get up here so that it'll go around. This is one eighth. I just notch the mass, CA it, put again another cotter pin up in here. There's virtually nothing on the top of this rig. Down here, I use, uh, I do a couple of things. I found that to be able to adjust, I can adjust the height of my jib boom with this. I can make it higher. You've got to try and make your rig as flexible as you possibly can. In other words, see, I'll use, uh, I've got a lot, of, a lot of room in here that I can adjust, and I've got a lot of room up here that I can adjust. And the reason being is, if I want, I can bring my boom right up to here. But in light air or whatever, if it's, if it's late conditions, I want the air that's coming across the deck. I want to get the maximum amount of air that I can. And so I'll lower it. I'll leave it here. Funny enough, having said that, in the boat, the heavy weather boat, I run her that way too. I run her down as low as I can. I get this down as low as I possibly can. I don't use a 40, what is it, 45 inch mast or whatever they call for. That's 42. I cut my mast down. Because you can run it. You can run a lower mast. Because that's your control point there for your measurement for how far your mast is tilted forward and back, okay? Which we'll get to in a minute. These are plumbing washers. You can buy them in Home Depot or whatever, but you can also buy them in bulk. If it, I think, I forget where the place is. This was a little thing that came off of Micro Magic. It just happens to be the right size. I thought it will, with that pressure on that, that will pull that back across the boom. It's never moved. Things never moved at all. 
Again, I try and my cotter keys are in here, cotter pins, the small brass ones. Everything is as light as I possibly can. In Europe, when I sailed Micromagics, the guys even went one step farther. What they used was, they didn't even use these. And I'm thinking of getting, maybe trying one. I gotta build another rig. I'm gonna use those sails, but I'm gonna build another rig without these. They use uh, aquarium tubing. Or if you know of anybody that's on oxygen, like a friend, like I do, I use his tube. I, he's got others, he can still breathe. I, <laughs> I take his tubing anyway, his old tubing. And uh, it will slide over top of this quite nicely and just a small piece of it with a little oil and you can slide it along and it'll do. Um, in the Micromagics, they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to save as much weight as they can and they use, uh, they use the aquarium tubing, which is the, which on along their booms. So, um, basically, both these, I run this at 17 and 35, um, my stays. Some people vary them depending on what you want. I just figure out that, you know, I've still got enough. I can let it off at the top. Um, I get enough bend in, in the mast to make me happy with it um, on my control point. And this is where you'll get, you'll like I say, you'll never get two boats the same. You've got to sail the boat and the way you like to sail. I like to sail with a lot of weather helm. I want her to go up on her own. I want her to go as far up as she can go. And when it blows, I don't have to worry about it. She'll do it on her own. I'll let her go, and she'll go almost to the point where she's going to luff. And that's what I want it to do. Some people don't like sailing it. They don't like all that weather helm on it. They'd rather be in control of it. So I, I tilt my mast forward and backwards accordingly. Uh, I tend to run her a lot up um, on all my boats. This one was different because the balance point was different. I couldn't run it. The, I couldn't run it the very same. Um, my other boat... I can I can crank her up to the front and leave her there, and she'll uh, she'll stay there. And I light light wind, I do move this one back and forth, um, but I've still got my adjustment. I used I drilled. This is this is the fun part. You take a one eighth rod and you drill that thing through and put that cotter key through. You want to make sure you're in the center. You're going to have no boom left. I got to tell you, I think I've done a couple. And then I don't run a rod. I ran the bottom because this is this is uh, ball bearings out of a race car uh, races that we that we made up, and then just a piece of brass tube, and I just ran an end, just something I can tie onto, and then I can get my adjustment here. But this was as low as I possibly could get the booms on the boat. So, um, basically, that's about it. If you're going to put your batteries. When you put your, go to put your batteries in the boat, make sure you can move the things. Now, the, if you, anybody's on the Victoria site, you're going to see there's all kinds of controversy right now. When you go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's, go to wherever, and you buy any kind of screws, you get them in a package, right, like this. Take the top off the thing and use the package. Put Velcro on the bottom of it, put Velcro on the inside of it. Then put Velcro on the inside of the boat. I can take that battery pack, now I use a long one in there, because I just use double A's. I have gone to the LiPo thing. Uh, cheap and cheerful. I can take that on that Velcro strip that's on the bottom of the boat and I can move it back or I can move it forward. But any water that gets in the boat doesn't go near my batteries. It goes right past that plastic holder. And then with a plug in the back, out she goes. So I can run all day and the other boat, the blue one, she leaks. I don't know where. I can't find out, but she leaks. So I just keep dumping her and it goes past the batteries. The question they're arguing about now is you cannot have remo or movable ballast. But they will allow in Victoria that between races, let's say the wind came up and it's going heavier, you can move your batteries. It's legal to take that and move it farther back if I see the wind's coming up or, you know, vice versa, bring it up forward. They're saying if you're doing that, doesn't that calculate, doesn't that, isn't that movable ballast? Well, no, no, it's not really. The, le the letter of the law is movable ballast during the race. They don't want the thing, you know, so that you got it on slides or whatever. Make sure you have, put your batteries in these. Make sure you go and you build yourself one of these. That you can make sure that, and these little boats are critical, that at all times when you put this in, bingo, she's right dead on. Because if that mast is tilted one way or another, you're going to have problems tacking with it. It's a twitchy boat. you got to keep your eye on it. It's different to sail than a, than a soling. Um, it's not as forgiving as a soling. The smaller they are, the harder they are to sail. The bigger they are, the easier they get. These things, you've got to watch them all the time. If somebody, you'll be at the pond, somebody will say, do you see what so-and-so did? I don't even know he was there. I never take my eyes off the boat myself when I'm racing it. It's me, and if, unless there's somebody right beside me. But basically, it's so twitchy that I want to watch it all myself.
That's it. Any question? Yes, sir. Have you ever run a single side stay? I noticed Ron had one. On. He was only running yeah. one set of side stays. It, it, uh, I just wouldn't be sure where I'd want it. Like I want to have the, you know, in heavy wind, I want it off the top. I want it, I want to let it, I want to let the top off so she'll spill. So I don't, I don't know if he gained anything with it. I've never run, I've never tried it. I've always run the two. So you adjust your side stays? Yeah. When, do you adjust it when you're, you have to readjust when you're doing yep. your rake? Yeah, if it's a, like, I'm lucky enough I got the heavy weather boat in this one, and I don't usually touch this one. The heavy weather one, it stays the same as well, but it's off. The, the, the top ones are off. The top ones you can just go like this, they're, lo they're loose. Because I, I like it off. But I do adjust them, and then you got to do it with this, too. So like with the sticks, check on the stick yeah. after. Your uh, booms, do they flex in the heavy wind? Not that I, not that I notice. Um, 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 you sail shape if they did. Yeah. It? That's why we went, you know, that's why we went to the curved booms, because you're, that's three-eighths of an inch. You can't have it any more, any wider than a quarter, and you can't have it any deeper in three-eighths, but we did three-eighths booms and made them up ourselves and curved it the same as the bottom of the sail with it and, and cut them and everything, because that's three-eighths more sail area that you get. And I'll still run those in, in probably in light wind, along with these sails. That wouldn't flex? No. Like those bikes? Yeah, this, this bike, yeah. So yeah. they flex with your sail? Exactly. Yeah. Probably yes. Yes. Yeah. Can you explain again the advantage of moving the jib attachment point forward from what the uh, uh, you, Victoria if, instructed? If you put it here, in order to guarantee that it's going to it's going to swing out on you, you almost have to put you have to put some kind of a lead weight out here, uh, but to, to do it. it. When when I moved it up here, and it was not rocket science; it was purely by accident. Uh, I found that I didn't need it. That boat, if you if you want to let those sails out to go downwind, this thing will just flip out on its own. So I found I thought, okay, I can eliminate I can eliminate. See, you can have a you can have a lead weight on here. It cannot pass the bow according to the rules, right? So I just did this. Now I can move. I can slide this along. And I can make the boom. I can make the boom come out here if I wanted to. But I don't want a huge gap back in here. I want this as close to the as close to the mass as I possibly can. So I just found that up in here, I eliminated the, the weight, and, and it did what I wanted it to do. It'll come out and stay out. So, so I can do that with my Nirvana, too. Yeah? It makes it illegal. You're not allowed to do that. Oh, you have to, oh, you have, to have it in the, in the holes? Yeah, yeah. but I, I'm not in any sanctioned races, so I'll probably do that. Yeah, <clears throat> it just makes it easier. Have you ever heard of somebody putting the servos and all of that in with caulking? Yeah, I ran into some jerk in Ohio once that was a big mouth. He would tell us, he would call starboard if it was he was out in the parking lot. And he'd say, I'm on starboard, you know. Finally, somebody went and tapped him with a hammer and said, like, shut up. And this guy had his servos glued to the bottom of the boat. And he got water in him. And then he wanted an over. He wanted to know if he could have a double five-minute hold so that he could re-glue his servos. We said, see ya, pal. He was gone. That's the only time I've ever seen it happen. Does he? He just glues them to the bottom. Yeah, we're talking, you know. The other thing in this, you want to make sure you're rough in the inside of those boats. Like, don't just epoxy anything to it without going over it with some heavy grit sandpaper because it won't stick. I've taken a couple. I took that other gentleman's apart that he built. Remember the one we redid that he passed? And it just you could just snap the thing apart with it. So. All right. Yes, sir. <clears throat> you ever had any trouble with your rudder post or your keel post? Trouble how? Well, I found on... Mine and I read on the internet a little bit. They tend to rust and get loose. You ever mm, encountered that? No, I, I rust. They certainly would if you're in salt water. But you uh, it, do you see a it, you know, like I see a them around the bottom when the rudder's out I, and you put the I I, I sort of countersink it a bit, stick the tube in and see a all around it. Oh, not the tube, Bill. I'm sorry, the the post, the shaft on the rudder itself. The rudder oh, really? You grease that anyway. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I found mine just it got loose uh, between the the plastic of the rudder itself and the uh, this. Yeah. Oh really? On my keel, it's fine, but no. And I've read it's gone. No, never had, never had. Has it really? Yeah. I replaced mine with stainless anyway, but uh, I just do. Uh, I just Vaseline the darn thing, you know, and it seems to. Save it. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bill.